some easier questions um a lot of the people that are on the facebook group they want to know more about uh kind of what, what what your time is like and then what more about what you plan to do when you're out which i think that's always an interesting question so um i'm going to start with let's see well elizabeth bennett i'll start with elizabeth bennett she would like to know uh, she'd like to know what your life is like in prison. So if you can, I know that's a huge question, but if you could briefly give us an idea of what it's like in there. Yep. Day to day. Yeah, day to day. Um, okay, it's very busy. Um, I'm involved in a lot of activities here in the prison, and I do a lot of my job. So I have um, very, very busy days um, between working in the work in the mornings and I work in the afternoon uh, the ACE office, which is the AIDS Counseling and Education Office here. Mm -hmm. So I'm there in the mornings in the afternoon and at night I have church on Sundays, I have work on Mondays, I have RTA on Tuesdays and Thursdays and I have praise dancing on Friday. So it's like every night I really have something to do. And when I do have a moment um, where I don't, I'm running around doing a lot of IRC business for the inmate liaison committee. So I'm usually running from 8 in the morning to 9.30 at night every day. I'm never sitting still doing absolutely nothing. I'm sure, that, I'm sure that helps a little bit, but still. I mean, it's, it probably helps to stay busy. Well, it does because the things I'm involved in are all very positive and very productive. So it gives me a chance to make a difference, to make the community that I live in right now better, and to do what I can to help other people. Because there's a constant flow of people coming to me that need help, all kinds of things from legal work to family matters to school work or, you know, health issues at the job. So, I try to schedule everybody in so I can meet up with people and see how I can help them to build up. I mean, thanks to God that I do have the opportunity to do kind of things that I want to do. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I love about being here. Yeah. 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 Um, I would probably change the fact that everything is um, designed, it's not designed to rehabilitate, it's designed to be very oppressive. And for a lot of the officers here and the staff here, they feel like, you know, that prison is not the punishment. They feel like they have to punish us in addition to what we have read the sentence to. So they come in with a very negative attitude and they do call us names or treat us badly. And if I, was, if I were able to make prison life better, I would make it a more constructive environment for rehabilitation so that it's not conducive to people actually making changes in their lives and characters and attitudes and job skills so that when they get into, back into society, they'll be more productive citizens. Right. Uh, Beth would like to know uh, what is the strongest asset you hope to contribute to society as a reformed lifer? I think the strongest thing I have to offer is my positive attitude. Um, I approach every single situation that I'm in trying to make things better, trying to solve differences or problems. I'm a very good worker. I have no problem putting in 100% and have more effort into everything I do. And I think that when I, when I, I know that when I come home, that wherever I am and whatever I'm involved in, I'm going to bring that same attitude. And it seems to be a motivating factor, like, everywhere I go. I really feel like our life choices, whatever situations we're in, 
um, create the world we live in. Yeah. And what I mean by that is even, even if you're in a situation outside of prison, and if it's bad or a negative situation, how you approach that and how you deal with it makes all the difference. Because you could just, I could just shrivel up and die here and give up and, and not want to do anything because my, my future looks so hopeless. But I know that I have chosen to make my life rich despite my circumstances. But I have to work to do that every single day. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you a little bit, a tougher question, um, one that has a little bit more to do with what happened uh, in Derry during that time. Um, this is from me, actually. A lot of the people in the media said that you were cold. I'm putting that in quotation marks. Uh, and the Derry Police Department, they even said that they suspected you because you were cold. Um, can you talk a little bit about your demeanor right after Greg's death and tell us what was going on and how being labeled cold affected you in the long term? negatively and it's something that kicked and carried on and carried through all the way up until now. And unfortunately, it's just absolutely not true. Anybody who knows me knows that that is the last adjective they would get to describe me in any circumstances. And when the media pounced and day after day after day, it was just this onslaught of negativity and just untruths about me and tearing me apart, I think that almost as a defense mechanism, I shut down. And I believe part of that is because I come from a family where we learn to deal with whatever problems happen by just remaining strong and standing strong and not being like weeping willows, so to speak, over whatever happens. I'm more of a private person when I deal with my own pain and my own emotions. So for me to be only 22 years old and tend to be 24 at the time and have what I thought was my whole future with him just completely obliterated and having to deal at such a young age with funeral and weeks and then the fact that Bill Finn was arrested and I had a relationship with him and then finding out that it looked like he did it or his friends did it and then I was arrested. It was just like one thing after another after another. And I think part of my my being able to survive was me being able to just completely shut down. Right. You were probably in shock, I'm assuming. Uh, I was in a lot of shock about just the fact that I, I really could not believe that I was arrested in, in prison for something that I didn't do. And I kept thinking initially that this is just going to get straightened out. And... Hopefully I'll be home in a few days, and as things went on, and it just started looking worse and worse, and I was being completely painted as the victim that I wasn't, and Bill was being painted as this victim, it, it just, it kept getting worse and worse, and I felt like I had no time ever to even deal with the fact that Greg was gone, because I was just compounded with disaster after disaster. And being so young and not having any experience with all of that trauma, I think I brought myself off from it. And it was just like I was there, but I mean, sometimes when I watch video of the trial and um, or sentencing and other things, I see myself there and I almost, like, I know I was there. I don't have amnesia or anything, but like, I can't even really remember it. It's like, I, it was just stuff was happening that I had no control over outside of me, and I just felt like I was there, but it almost like it wasn't me. Right. Can, can you, yeah. if it's not too difficult, would you mind just sort of recounting what happened the night that Greg passed? What happened, you know, after you were able to leave the condo? Um, I, I went immediately to Greg's parents' house with my mother and my sister and Greg's mom and dad and his brothers and then various friends of ours that people got the news were coming over. It was getting later and later. It was like 12, 1, 2 o'clock. Um, I was crying so bad, hysterical, that they had called the victim's um, assistant from the state over to help and to try to get her through the night and through all the pain and suffering that we were going through, just 
crying about Greg and what had happened to him and confusion. And at one point, I know that I, I had to get a T-shirt from someone in their family because my shirt was dripping up from crying and sweating. And it was just a really emotional night, almost like, it, was, it just felt like it wasn't really happening. Like, I, I would just be there and be crying and then have to just say for a second, like, oh my God, this is really happening. It just felt like a nightmare that I wanted to wake up from. But as the hours passed, no one was waking me up and it was reality and it was just, it was just incredibly difficult to deal with. Mm-hmm. I didn't fall asleep until I think like four or five in the morning, I finally was taken back to my mom, my mom and dad's house, and I was in the bed sleeping in my room, you know, the room I grew, grew up in pretty much, and my sister was in the bed with me, and I don't really remember, but they said I, I woke up and I just started screaming at the top of my lungs, they all ran in the room, that they were bird, that it was and I literally remember that to me, it, it wasn't a dream. I don't know if it was because I was up for so many hours. I was so stressed out. And, uh, just uh, too much emotional trauma one night or whatever. But I literally looked up and it was like there were birds flapping all over the ceiling. And they had to like, call me to tell me that they weren't there for a few minutes before I could even break out of it, that they really weren't there. And I know that that's because I'm really afraid of birds. I mean, I'm assuming that everything happened so fast, you weren't really able able to mourn or properly bury him, or, you know, can you talk a little bit about that process? I don't even remember any of it. Hmm. I, I mean, I literally don't remember any of it, because it was just like a big blur. I, I can't, it was, to me, it was just so surreal, and, and that's the only adjective I can think of to describe it, because it felt like it wasn't happening. Yeah, I well, know I was there. I mean, I wasn't hallucinating or anything. I knew I was in it. It was happening. But it just seems like, you know, this is, it's, to me, it felt like this is something that, that older people deal with. Like, young people don't deal with this. It just felt like something that I had absolutely no experience with. And it was just a rush of things that, that had to be done and taken care of. And, decisions that had to be made and, and I just it was like a whirlwind of stuff happening and mainly all I could think about was that Greg was really gone. You know, it was just it, I just felt like he he was gonna walk through the door any minute. That, that he was that this was all not really true. And it just I just remember a lot of being confused about so much and being so sad. You know, that's really the overwhelming emotions that I had at the time yeah. and you know a, a questioning we all had so many questions like how did this happen what happened and, you know were there any leads and, and that kind of stuff from the beginning just trying just talking about over and over and trying to figure out what happened right. none of us myself included had even thought of anything you know remotely as what it turned out to be. 
I mean, sometimes people look at the case now and they say, oh, well, you know, when you first found Greg, did you think, oh, my God, Bill must have done this? Absolutely not. That wasn't even in my realm of thinking because as far as my life was, I didn't know people who went and killed people. I, I just, it, I mean, it wasn't even a thought in my head. And originally the police were saying that the house was burglarized, things were stolen, and Greg interrupted the burglary. So what the official story was, was that he, he must have seen whoever it was and either he knew them or... They got afraid because he saw them, and then they killed him. So it was just a story that we were going by that the police were feeding us at the time, and the media, and peace. That is like my, the worst thing that I think about all the time is what was Greg thinking, and what was he saying, and what was he doing, and what really happened in our house. Because I, I, I don't, like, 100% believe the story that the the guys gave um, from what happened in the house. It doesn't even make sense for him to be. I just, what was he feeling? You know, was he afraid? Did, did, did he know? You know, just those things are like always in my mind. And that just makes me the saddest, you know, wondering what it was he went through in the house. Yeah, I imagine. And we've talked before too, um, you know, about your thoughts on that because, I mean, you're obviously the most familiar with the condo that you guys lived in and you are, you, you say that there's really no way physically it could have happened the way that Bill and Pete Randall said it happened. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, they say that, that um, Greg was shot, fine, the fine six say that he, he was shot and the angle that he was shot from would, like, would not match with a left-handed um, killer, and Bill Slim was left-handed. So if he was truly where he said he was behind Greg and went to shoot Greg with his left hand, he would have had to have reached his whole hand around in an unnatural position to shoot him and kind of then shooting towards his own self. It makes more sense that a right-handed person killed Greg and he was standing in front of Greg and that is supposedly where Pete Randall was and Pete Randall is right handed. So there's just a lot of things um, that people seem to pass over when it comes to what happened in our condo and when we paint this picture of Daryl and Pete as these innocent guys and especially Daryl as someone doing something that he supposedly didn't want to do and all that and we forget that Greg got beat up before he was killed. Right. They, they fought him in the house. They jumped him. They hit him. They hurt him. But these were not um, innocent people that didn't want to do this to him. And that's just the part that I just get so crazy about in my head because it, I just I just imagine Greg scared. And I just, it just makes me really sad. Mm. And I don't feel like I'm ever going to know the truth because I don't trust either one of them in anything they say. I mean, we do know that Greg was beat up and that he did have injuries consistent with that. So that did happen. And, I mean, somebody tried to rip, literally rip the, a ring off of his finger so bad that he had injuries and abrasions to his finger from somebody trying to tear it off him. But Daryl and Pete, neither one of them, in their, according to their testimony, said that anything happened like that. So how did that happen to Greg? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a trial full of inconsistencies. Guy, yeah, the forensic guy also said that there was something in between the gun and Greg's head. And neither one of them said anything was there. So I guess, you know, I don't know all this about forensics, but according to like gunpowder residue and all of that, they can tell whether there's some intermediate device between uh, the muzzle of a gun and a person, wherever the person got shot on their skin. And they're saying there was something there. What was there? And why are, why are they lying? I really need a forensic expert to look at that. And it's sad because I, I really needed one to look at it, you know, during my trial and to point out those inconsistencies. But back then and now today, I'm just a regular person and I don't have I'm not O.J. Simpson. I can assemble a dream team of lawyers and experts and all of that. And when this happens, something like this happens to a regular person just going through life, 
that doesn't have the resources and is up against the monster of the state and all of its resources, the whole story never gets told. Right. And to me, it's really sad. What if I had the money for an expert? Would I be... Would I have been found not guilty? Right. I mean, you know, it, it is frustrating because there is forensics evidence that people didn't seem to pay attention to. It did right. seem like there was something between the gun and Greg. Right. You know, one of the main things that, that stuck out to me in the transcript uh, is that Bill Flynn's mom got rid of evidence for him. So right. where did that evidence yeah. go and why, didn't, why wasn't she prosecuted too? Yeah, she said she burnt it. Yeah. See, Randall's mother did um, evidence, too. And a part of his deal was that his mother wasn't going to get prosecuted. Of course, you know, he said from the stand, oh, no, that wasn't really part of my deal, you know. But when pressed by my lawyers, my lawyer said, well, like, I mean, did they tell you your mother wasn't going to get arrested? And he was like, yeah, you know. So if they told you your mother was going to get arrested, would you have really, you know, made this deal? So obviously it was implicit in there that, you know, we would take care of your mother and she wouldn't get arrested. Right. Or because it's not in writing as part of his deal, same thing as Cecilia Pierce. According to the state, she had no deal. None. Whatsoever. Hmm. Okay? But she said from the stand that, and my lawyer said, are you going to be arrested? And she said, no. And my lawyer said, well, how do you know that? And she said, the police told me. And she, they, they said who? And she said, Captain Jackson, and when they went back and, and put in a motion right there, they asked for a recess and put in a motion for a new trial, because this is a deal we never heard about, and Judge Gray just being all right over it. Huh. Tony Graham sent in a question online that kind of goes along with that, too. Uh, he asked, on the tape they played in court, you said they only played part of the tape. What else uh, is on that tape that we have not heard? And there was also the issue that the tapes weren't authenticated, they weren't compared to the originals, they were enhanced, all that stuff. And then there was the fact that, correct me if I'm wrong, there were two tapes that weren't even a, uh, put into evidence, and they were the first two tapes, and on those tapes you right. completely denied any involvement, is that correct? Everything, everything. everything. So the two tapes that never, Just to, I just want to clarify for the audience, the two tapes that never made it into the court hearing that the jury never heard and never were made aware of, you completely denied any involvement whatsoever when asked on tape in front of many witnesses because I think at that point Cecilia Pierce and her mom and two or three detectives were sitting there listening in. And in those two tapes, you denied it. Yes, that's absolutely true. Those two tapes, I'm denying everything, and of course the jury never heard that. Right. Neither one of them. They only played the two cases that they felt were incriminating. The only person who had any kind of information that was giving me any kind of information about anything that happened in my house on May 1st was Cecilia Pierce. Okay. The police had completely shut down, and obviously now, looking backwards, that was because they had me as a suspect. But at the time, I was the widow. And I, that this was my husband who was murdered. And like any family member, uh, including his mom and dad, we were all calling the police every day or speaking with the police every day to find out what was going on with the case. And what I found is that I, I couldn't get any information at all from them. And 
when I spoke to Cecilia Pierce, she was the only one that seemed to have all these details about it. The fact that there was a knife used um, on the night of the murder, that the knife was dropped on, and along with other items on the way outside of our condos, which proved which way um, the person or people who were responsible at the time exited the condo. Um, the fact that there was supposed to have been a previous attempts on Greg's life. Those were all things that I went through conversation with Cecilia Pierce. Okay, let me let me interrupt you really quickly just because I want to ask a follow-up here. So you're you're just to clarify, you're saying that once you started talking to Cecilia on the phone during the wiretaps, she had all this information about the crime scene and the people involved and all this stuff. And did you ask did you No, I was gonna say, did you I mean, where did she get this information? Well, apparently, that's what I wanted to know, because apparently she got it from the principal people involved in the case. And why she had so much knowledge and where she got it from was important to me. But mainly, I really wanted to know, was was this true? Is this really what happened? Did Bill Flynn really do this? And... I, I mean, when I first heard, like I said before, when I first heard that he was arrested, I thought that somehow the police found out about the affair and they had arrested the wrong person. But it wasn't until the ballistics test came back with the actual gun being, having been identified as, as the murder weapon that I kind of had to stop in my tracks and really begin to accept that this is looking like this is really what happened. And... Then that, I mean, obviously that was a horrible thing for me to have to run and accept because now not only was I dealing with the fact that my husband was murdered, but he was murdered by somebody I knew, and not only somebody I knew, but somebody I had a relationship with. So I'm, I'm sure you can imagine how I was feeling about all of that. Right. And I was desperate at the time for any information because really what I wanted was for somebody to tell me that this wasn't how it happened but she was the only one that seemed to have any information and as I was trying to put these pieces together her being my only source I literally went to um Greg's best friend Brian Washburn at the time and told him that I felt that actually that was the night before the wiretap that I felt like she knew more than she was saying and the only way that I could get any information from her was just allowing by allowing her to talk Obviously, I couldn't go in there with a list of questions and be like I was having a police interrogation. Right. But I felt like if I kind of, you know, made it like I, I knew, you know, something was going on and maybe she would kind of open up to me and that's exactly what happened. And that's exactly where I was getting information from because my only other source of information besides the city here was the TV set every night. Right. And half of that information wasn't even true. So a lot of times when, along with the information I was getting from the TV, there were people literally being interviewed on TV that were saying things about me, and underneath their, their picture, it would say, Pam Smart's childhood friend, and I've never seen the person in my entire life. So I knew some of the things that I was hearing on the TV that were absolutely not true, but as for a person that's desperate for any information, I was still glued to it because it was like the only source out there besides her. So you were you were basically trying to get the information about your husband's murder from her because the police weren't telling you anything. Right. If she could confide in me a little bit or talk about it because apparently she was a nervous wreck that she was going to get arrested. And, uh, and as the pieces came together, I understand why. But at first I couldn't understand why, you know, what... Why, why did she know so much, and what was her role, and, and how, how much of a, a relationship and a part did she have in anything that was going on? So I was just trying to figure everything out. I just desperately wanted to know who killed Greg and why. And then when they got arrested, like, was it really them, and did this really happen? Because I really could not believe that Bill Flynn, this person that I thought that I knew, had committed this crime. And it must have been incredibly shocking also to find out that Cecilia would actually help them by, like, looking for, to try to find a gun to help Bill kill Greg. 
Yeah, and so the more she, the more she confided, and the more she talked, it was, it was almost like she was bleeding information. And at, at trial, the police made this big deal of the fact that okay, so show me where you asked her a question, and show me where you gave her an answer. And my point is that when you have conversation with people, you don't you don't have to. Um, solicit information through questions, a lot of times you just let the person talk and they say whatever is, uh, you know, there to be said. And that's exactly what was happening. Right. So there were also a lot of times on the tapes where they attributed, uh, I mean, the tapes on could not be heard. They were not audible in the courtroom. Even Greg's um, father took off the headphones and said he couldn't hear anything. You could, you could not decipher anything by listening. So what the jury was doing was reading a transcript that someone, we still don't even know who, had transcribed um, from their listening to the tape. And as I was listening to it and could hear pieces of it, and I was reading the conversation flat on the page, I was noticing that there were things that were attributed to me that were, it was actually her talking. Or mm. things that were attributed to her and it was actually me talking. Because our voices sounded similar only because they were so garbled and you could really but obviously I know my own voice and I know what I said. Right. So but to a person who's not the, the actual one that has the voice you're reading it flat on the page. And also what happened too is that when you have a conversation even like the one I'm having with you right now, you're interjecting in my conversation saying right, yes, uh huh that's what we do when we have conversation. Right. But flat on the paper, it looks like she's saying, oh, so you wanted Greg dead? And then I say, yeah. But that's, that's not how the conversation was going. It wasn't a response to necessarily whatever you just said. It was just the natural course of listening to a person and saying, yeah, okay, uh-huh, whatever we do when we talk because it shows the person that we're listening to what they're saying. Right. Yeah, and then and then there's also the fact that so those transcripts and those inaudible tapes were the only thing that the jury made their decision on. Yes. Yes. Because so the jury themselves said that they didn't believe um, Bill, Pete, or, or Vance when they were on the stand that they felt that they were liars. They felt that they had things to gain and for Billy Pierce. So they didn't really take their testimony as 100 percent true. And instead relied on these unauthenticated tapes that were inaudible, that were transcribed by, we don't even know who, if the person was a, a valid, trained transcriptionist or what have you. And there's a huge portions of the tape that are supposedly inaudible, inaudible, inaudible. Like, if you look at it right on the page, it's all you see, inaudible, inaudible. What was happening between on those spaces? Why is everything inaudible? Right. Like, to me, it was really weird. Because mm. I know during the conversation, I, I specifically recall, and I recall all the way 25 years ago, having a long part of the tape where I was talking about the police over and over and how the police weren't telling me anything. And the police were shutting me out of the investigation. And all of that, none of that is on any of these transcripts. Right. Well, we, and we talked about this before. Go ahead. I was going to say, I remember it specifically because there was a police chief at the time, and his name was Lorraine Jackson, the Gary police chief. And I remember saying, Captain Jackson is an asshole, and actually thinking in my mind that he's probably listening while I'm saying this, but I didn't even care. Right. And that was not on there either. You have 60 seconds remaining.